Good evening. I'm Fiona Branton, president of the Harvard Law School Forum, and I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. Our guest tonight is truly one of the funniest people I've met. She is best known as the author of a thrice weekly humor column entitled At Wit's End, which appears in 900 newspapers throughout the world and is read by an estimated 31 million people. The target of her column is usually the family, and I guess almost everyone can identify with the types of situations that she writes about. Irma Bombeck has done a lot of other things since she got her start writing obituaries and weather forecasts for the Dayton Journal Herald in her hometown. She's written eight books. She's been named to the list of the 25 most influential women in America by the World Almanac seven times. She's a graduate of the University of Dayton, and she holds 12 honorary doctorates. She's a member of the Society of Professional Journalists, and in 1978, she was appointed by President Carter to serve on the Women's Advisory Committee for Women or the President's Advisory Committee for Women, sorry. She was a regular on ABC's Good Morning America for 11 years. She created, wrote, and produced a sitcom named Maggie for ABC, and she has appeared on the cover of Time Magazine. She's even been a Grand Marshal in the Rose Parade. Irma Bombeck is currently working on a book um, on a more serious topic for the American Cancer Society concerning children with cancer. She has three grown children, and she lives with her husband in Arizona, and she travels an awful lot. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am very pleased to present a distinguished journalist and a very funny woman, Ms. Irma Bombeck. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've, I've never really addressed a fireplace before. It's <laughs> weird, truly weird. Um, having me speak to a group of law students is probably about as ludicrous as assigning an Avon lady to Tammy Baker. Um, I, I don't know what I could possibly add, but I'll, I'll try. Um, I, I, I don't speak on campuses uh, very often. I figure if students wanted this kind of guilt, they could call their mothers. But um, So you're probably asking, so why am I here? Well, a couple of years ago, I attended my son's graduation at the University of Southern California. And the graduation speaker was very eloquent. And he said, you can climb every mountain, ford every stream, travel every highway until you find your dream. And he couldn't find his car after graduation. <laughs> so he had taken a, a rather eclectic curriculum, uh, transcendental bowling, uh, history of the croissant, uh, <laughs> holistic car repairs, which really were invaluable, and a variety of, of uh, cinema classes that were to make him a legend in his own time. But I feel that with all the education, he had missed something very important. He came out of school believing that the most important thing in his life was that he was going to win the Nobel Prize for Literature. He was going to travel extensively and give lectures all over the world. He would have a, probably have a chair endowed for him at the university and be interviewed by uh, Johnny, Phil, Oprah, Sally, Jesse, Larry, and Geraldo in the same day. <laughs> now, I hated to depress the kid, as, as I really hate uh, to depress all of you here this evening, but I have seen your future, and I am it. <laughs> I'm sorry. In spite of the fact that all of you will have wonderful careers, most of you will live ordinary lives just like the ones I write about. Most of you will get married and buy a car that will not outlast the payments. You are going to have babies that cry all night and sleep all day. You will spend $20,000 to have the teeth of your kid fixed, who will never smile anyway. <laughs> You'll take the family camping where you're going to be parking next to a public toilet and do your laundry in a saucepan, and then you'll ride home and tell what, everyone what a terrific time you had camping. And you'll probably come very close to divorce at some time in your life when your spouse lands on Park Place 
and charges you $4,000 for the rent. <laughs> and you know something? Those are going to be the happiest days of your life. And I'm telling you all this because when I lived it, I didn't for a minute believe it either. I think I had to set it all down on paper before I really realized what I really had. The thing about humorist, uh, just a few insights tonight, is that we're never what we seem to be. I think people imagine that we sit around all the time laughing at life's little detours and just really having a really swell time. I wish all this were true. Um, all my life, I don't speak for, the, for Buckwald and Baker and the others, but all my life I... I have worried about every little thing you can imagine. Always have, I always will. I, um, I worry about accepting a drink from a urologist with a great sense of humor. Um, I worry about loaning my car to someone to whom I'm related. I worry about uh, Princess Di losing her hat during Harry's delivery. And I, I have to constantly remind myself that as the, as the Pope once said, or, or maybe it was Paul Harvey, it was one of them, <laughs> that a man does not live by somberness alone. He does need a little bit of humor in his life. And my ambition to become a humorist actually surfaced one day in Centerville, Ohio in 1965. And I was on my knees in the utility room, true story, and I was sorting socks when my small son came in and he said, my socks don't match. And I said, I, I, can't, I can't help it, that's all the washer gave me back. <laughs> and he said, I really, I really do not understand this. If you put a pair of socks in the washer and only one comes back, where does the other sock go? And I said, it went to live with Jesus. <laughs> and he said to me, you don't know anything. And I looked in the mirror and the kid was absolutely right. I was 37 years old with a husband who had married me during the, uh, a commercial break in the World Series. <laughs> Um, I had two sons, uh, Cain and Abel, and um, a daughter who would grow up to found the Dan Rather Charm School, and my role model was absolutely the Statue of Liberty. I, I couldn't imagine anyone having a 35-inch waist and upper arms that could hold 185 tourists. I thought that was great. <laughs> I was really caught up in, in, in the life of suburbia, as, as uh, a few of the women in the audience is, is tonight. My husband watched 187 televised football games a weekend. He had seen, true, had seen more bulls than the latrine officer at Fort Dix. Um, I burped Tupperware. Um, I sat around, I cro crocheted these little uh, serapes and hats for my Tabasco sauce. and. Um, and my kids never ate anything that had not danced on television, so. It, it was incredible being a mother because I can remember getting up in, in mornings in Centerville, Ohio, and my kids would say, I'm in a school play, I need a costume, and I'd say, what is a mother for? What are you? And they'd say, I'm a participle, <laughs> you know. So. I, um, I lived across the street from uh, Phil Donahue, uh, whom I only mention his name just to impress you. Um, <laughs> it was back in the 60s and he had five kids and, and we had three and, and our careers were starting to build at that moment. He had um, a show called Conversation Piece on, on radio and it was really glamorous. He was interviewing all these people who went through uh, our state. And I, on the other hand, was gathering this questionable material for a humor column. And I always noticed whenever they wanted housewives to feel really terrific about themselves, they would say, you know, I was a nurse, a chauffeur, a cook, a financier, a mistress, and a teacher. But there were a lot of jobs I did that really uh, defied a, a category. I remember one day one of my kids swallowed a, a nickel, and um, I was ready to write it off, you know. Uh, <laughs> 
it was no big deal. But my mother was horrified, and she said, you take that child to the doctor and have him x-rayed. You will never forgive yourself if something happens. So I walked into this doctor's office. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm a college graduate. I have a degree in English. I mean, we're not dealing with some nothing here. <laughs> And I walked in, and he looked at me with a straight face, and he said, um, Mrs. Bombeck, I want you to watch his stool. And I said, why would I want to do that? <laughs> and he said, well, don't you want to know where the nickel is? And I said, really, not that bad. Um, I have an independent income. But, but what we did... <laughs> We did, we did just a lot of gross things in, in, in those times. I, I can remember uh, uh, taking knots out of shoestrings with my teeth that the kid had wet on all day long. And then about 15 years ago, um, a very funny thing happened to me on the way to the utility room. Uh, <laughs> a woman's revolution broke out in this country, and someone had the wisdom to figure out that we were equal to a lot of benefits that men were getting. And after all, we figured that Ginger Rogers did every dance Fred Astaire did. Uh, she only did it backwards and in high heels. <laughs> so I think it was evident that women were sick of fighting the wax buildup and, and the ring around the collar. Uh, they were women, like I was, who was at an awkward age of their life. I was too old for a paper route, too young for social security, and too tired for an affair. <laughs> so they had another life left in them, and a another life to give, and they really wanted to trade up. They were women who had been invisible, and I felt like one of them because my kids would come home at night and stare me right in the eyeball and say, anyone home? <laughs> So I didn't wait to be drafted. I, I joined the revolution for equality because when my grandchildren asked what I did in the sexual revolution, I didn't want to say I gave it the office. So I hit the trail for the Equal Rights Amendment, which I referred to as the most misunderstood 24 words since one size fits all. And um, I understand you had Ellie Schmiel here, uh, the speaker of, what, a couple weeks ago? A couple weeks ago, um, I, I was with her in Atlanta. We, we had a, a meeting that four first ladies had called, and, and we were delving into the Constitution. Uh, I think that's what it was called, the Constitution, of which we're not in it. And the four first ladies were um, Mrs. Ford, Ms. Johnson, Ms. Nixon, and Ms. Carter. And they wanted to focus attention on women once more, because we have done some backsliding. They were all there from Abzug to Weddington, from Steinem to Ferraro, from Coretta Scott King to Sandra Day O'Connor. And in many ways, I, I felt like a, a, a veteran who had come back for a meeting of the VFW. You know, we, we were recounting our old, old war stories and, and telling about our, our wounds and, and uh, being reunited with old friends. And I wasn't one of the generals in the war. I'm not going to tell you that. I was, I was a foot soldier. Um, I just slodged my way through enemy territory, uh, talking to anyone who would listen to me. What I did for love, you would not believe. Um, I gave a razorback hog call in Arkansas. I ate by candlelight with Teamster bosses in Missouri. I do not want to discuss where Jimmy Hoff is buried, so don't ask me. I auctioned off my husband's underwear at a fundraiser in Arizona. The good news is that he was not in them at the time. <laughs> and in Salt Lake City, um, I got there around Mother's Day, and uh, almost instantly I uh, became very unfunny, and my books were taken out of, the, uh, out of the windows of the bookstores and went to that big garage sale in the sky. But love us or hate us, I just don't think there is one woman in this entire world who has not been affected positively by what we did. Um, the column that I write had to reflect all of that. And so people have traveled with me through the age of Aquarius and the day Barbie went corporate. 
and through Betty Crocker's three facelifts. Um, the flower children went off of the 60s. Uh, they went off to college, taking with us all of our linens and beddings and cars and appliances. I know when, when our kids left with you know, the station wagon full of stuff, my husband said, why, why, why do they have to take all this stuff and go away to school? And I said, because they're getting away from our materialism. <laughs> the latchkey kids were born, uh, kids who had their own door key at five, operated a microwave oven at four, and had a, a first word at age three, and the word was Jordash. <laughs> and we're up to 77 million baby boomers who used to say animals they couldn't pronounce, drove BMWs, voted Republicans, and said wonderful things like, you all have a good day now. Uh, the older mother emerged. Um, they always fascinate me somehow. I can just see them entertaining their kids by having them connect liver spots on their hands. But uh, And then there was that somber day of April 19th of 1987, when I opened my paper and realized that women were being allowed to join the Rotary Club. It was a big moment in my life. <laughs> I looked at that and I thought, boy, as a feminist, I have been cursed, I have been picketed, I have been held up to ridicule, I had been told to go home. There was a senator in North Carolina who told me to go home and have babies, and I said, sweetie, I'm between estrogen and death. That's not going to happen. <laughs> Can you imagine all this? Okay, I did all of that stuff. But to join Rotary, I fell on my knees and said, please, God, please do not make me do this. <laughs> I think one of the biggest changes that occurred, uh, touch upon it just a little bit, is the uh, institution of marriage. And a philosopher once said, marriage is our last and probably our best chance to grow up. And he probably could be right. Uh, if I had known when I walked down the aisle in 1949 that I was marrying a man who would dedicate his entire life to going through the house and turning off lights where there were no people in the room. <laughs> Today I would be Sister Mary Carlotta of the convent. <laughs> this man is miserable. I figure in 38 years of marriage, the Prince of Darkness has saved us probably 12 cents. <laughs> Every day of our lives, we fight the battle of it. He goes through, he fiddles with the thermostat all the time, makes me crazy. Uh, one morning, I was sitting at the breakfast table, and, and I, I turned up the park on my bathrobe. And uh, <laughs> I said, you know, this, this is quite ridiculous. I am really afraid to fall asleep. <laughs> And he looked at me and he said, nonsense. I mean, you have the body of a 20-year-old woman. I said, I should. That's the year you froze it. <laughs> <clears throat> Our kids are grown now, obviously. Um, they, um, they come home to a house that is no longer occupied by the same people they remember. And this is sort of different for us. We're, we're health conscious now. I mean, we buy sugar-free laxatives, and <laughs> it's true. And, and when the phone rings after 8.30 at night, I clutch my chest and say, my God, who would be calling us at this hour? You know how that goes. They come home to parents who, who sit around watching white rhinos mate on public television <laughs> and where all the clocks in the house blink because we have no idea how to reset them when they go out. <laughs> You, uh, you, you people have grown up with technology, and I, and I know this, and, and I, God, I think you're the bravest people I've ever met. There's no doubt about it, but, but we don't deal with it well at all. Um, the VCR is driving us nuts. Uh, we're not only watching television 12 hours out of every day, but we're taping another 12 hours. <laughs> And then you add to that all the new cassettes, and my husband running from room to room, channel searching, and the movie rentals, and we have had to cut corners because we're not going to live that long. <laughs> we, we have 60 minutes down to 30, and 2020 down to 1010, and anything that we see on World War II, 
we just fast forward it because we know how it's going to end. So. And I think the kids who are coming home now are very different. Uh, they only visit us when they're out of work, out of a job, out of love, out of money, or all of the above. And, and we're not their contemporaries now. It, it's, it's really a different feeling. They're, they're confronting me with things. Uh, one of them said to me the other day, you know, I will never forgive you for putting me out to play and locking the door when the chill factor was 17 below zero. But some days, some days when they're all employed and their cars are running, um, I have a real good, warm feeling for the fact that I took time out to have a family. And then other days, I feel I paid an exorbitant price for a bottle of tequila and a reckless night. Uh, when I was a kid, I, I really used to, um, to envy people who did these wonderful books of fiction on the Isle of Baghdad or Crete or some such place. And I think, boy, that really takes a lot of, a lot of talent and skill to really, to really put something like that down. I haven't told a lot of people this, but uh, for years after I began this column, I used to make apologies for it all the time. I'd, I'd tell the editors, I, I know, you know, it's just sort of, sort of light fluff, and it's not really hard news, and it's probably not the things that make a difference in people's lives. Well, I have stopped doing that. I've stopped beating myself because I, I've, I've come to realize something very important, that the hardest thing in this world to capture and to have you relate to it is the ordinary because that's where all of you live. You're the best critics in the world. You know what it's all about. And when you see something that isn't, that isn't, doesn't transfer exactly the way that you think it should, there's something wrong with it. Um, so I, I'm sort of happy with my whole life and what I'm doing now. I think you hear a lot of talk about success in the academic world. And I don't think a lot of people have any idea what it is and most people don't even know when they have it. I started out writing obituaries for the Dayton Journal Herald, and that may not sound like a lot, but I did get them to die in alphabetical order every single day of my life. Um, at 39, I published the first of eight books. At 42, I made my first comedy album for Warner Brothers, and it sold two copies at a J.C. Penney store in Beirut. <laughs> At 47, I, I joined um, Good Morning America, and uh, where I was a field correspondent for about 11 years. And that, that was sort of weird, because I remember when they first approached me to do that, um, they were getting together David Hartman, Nancy Dussault, Rona Barrett, Jack Anderson, Jonathan Winters, Geraldo Rivero, and myself. And I must have laughed for 15 minutes. I said, my god, the idea of those people in the same country at one time just boggles my mind, let alone the same show. Uh, but I did have a good time on it. At age 55, I did write and produce um, a sitcom for ABC called Maggie. And I had to smile when she was mentioning this, because uh, um, if you went out for a beer, you missed it. I mean, it was <laughs> That little baby was canceled so fast. Um, at age 60, uh, I'm at work on another book, and I've just finished my first play. I, I don't do all these things uh, trying to be a success. I guess I do them because I, I enjoy the challenge of it, and it keeps like, life interesting. I, I, I tend to quote Woody Allen a lot, whom I absolutely love. And when he was asked if he, th he thought that he would continue to live in the hearts of his fans after he was gone, Woody said, I, I just want to live in my apartment, which I love. <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave some time. I cut a whole lot out tonight because I, I understand this is a, a question and answer form. So that's exactly what I'll do. Um, I know you have burning questions. God knows I have burning answers. Um, <laughs> I don't think there's any better way to get off of a speech than to tell you a line that I heard this week in, in Safeway as I was shopping. I, I said to the girl, I'm ready to check out now. And she said, honey, we all have to go sometime. So that's, <laughs> that's it.
Okay, I have on high heel shoes, so let's get on with it. <laughs> Anyone have any questions tonight? <laughs> Terrific. <laughs> yeah. When you laugh, it's an aerobic exercise. I've noticed that. <laughs> Incredible. Yes. Appreciate that. <laughs> think there's such turbulent times. I'm, I'm the perennial optimist. If, if I'm not an optimist, I'm in the wrong business. Um, I, don't, I don't see that at all. I, I think families have changed. I think they've regrouped and they've come back again. But you can't do anything to destroy the family. There, there's not a lot you can do with it because they'll go off and regroup in a, in a different way. Um, I think a lot of things have, have assaulted it. There's no doubt about it. But I'm still optimistic. I, th I think it's going to endure. It's going to last. There's just such a strong tie. In the, in the latest book, and I swore I wouldn't do this, Family, the Ties at Bind and Gag, um, in, in the latest book, I've alluded to this, that no matter what it is that happens to the family, it's, it's going to endure. No doubt about it. It just is. So I'm real optimistic about it. And also marriage. <laughs> yes? Uh, a lot of us here who are women are going to be facing the sort of conflict that many crew would have today, little time for family and how did you deal with this, and what advice do you have for us to deal with this? I have some real good advice. I really do. I, I just wish someone would listen to me sometime. I, I think what it is, in, in my era, it's, it was the same thing. You know, we had all these slick magazines, you know, telling us, you know, we were bored, depressed, neurotic, and unfulfilled, all of, all of those things. And I thought, my gosh, you know, we're, we're supposed to do all these things and be all these things to all these people. I got smart very quickly. Just relax and enjoy it. I mean, forget about what everyone else is doing. If you don't have a sense of humor about your kids, you won't have one about yourself, you won't have one about your life. And that has really sustained us. I don't take any of that seriously, including myself. And I relaxed with the kids, and I had a good time, and I figured, you know, 20 years, they're not going to remember if, if I put a second shine on that bathroom floor or not. I mean, who cares? Who cares? It, you know, I mean, we, we had toilet tissue spindles that never saw tissue on them. It doesn't make any difference, does it? And I, and I just sort of relaxed and enjoyed it, and I, and I think it sort of paid off because uh, the kids aren't too weird. Uh, they're employed. They have their own apartments. And, um, uh, of course, I walked in my son's apartment and Roach hung my coat up, but other than that, you know... <laughs> I, I, I think I think it's normal, and and my husband. I, I was I was blessed with having a husband who was born about 20 years before his time, and he allowed me to be. And a lot of feminists would say, well, why why would you ask him in the first place? Because my marriage is important to me, and I want him to want the same things that I do. So uh, we talk things out. We still do that. The kids say the only reason we stay together is to finish a sentence. That is not true. <laughs> well, maybe it is. Maybe it is. Um, but with a combination like that, you have to be wanting the same things. But it, it, it does work. You just sort of have to have your priorities and shuffle them around from time to time. Some of the things that were important to me at that time are no longer important now. I keep shuffling them around. And, and I still, I don't know what they talk about, quality time. I, st I still spend time with my kids. But I'm basically a workaholic. I, I love what I'm doing, and uh, I'm willing to work weekends for it. So the time that I take away, I take away from myself, usually. Is there a dry eye in the house? Yes. <laughs> Here in person as well, what, what do you like doing the most? 
I like the column. I like the column because in some weird way, I've always considered myself a newspaper woman. Can you believe that? I, I do. <laughs> I, do. Uh, I like the deadlines. I like to write on deadlines. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to a new syndicate. I'm leaving the LA Times syndicate, and I'm going to a new newspaper syndicate uh, on, in, in April. And I said, you know, I've got to have a shorter lead time. I have four weeks that I write ahead now. And I said, it's got to be shorter, because I've got to hop on these things. Um, when, when I see a story, you know, I, the bells go off and I'm following the fire again. I just want to sit down and do it right now. And one of the things I never got a chance to comment on was the Olympics. And I really wanted to say something about the Olympics because I have uh, Eric uh, Hayden thighs. And I thought, you know, <laughs> I never, I never want to do that sport. And I looked at the skiers and I thought, no, I don't want to do a sport where there's an ambulance waiting at the bottom of the hill. That is stupid. And I finally figured out that the real sport that I think is really going to be a comer for women is going to be the luge. And I think it's true. The reason why women are going to pick up on the luge is because when you lie flat on your back, your stomach is flat. It's just going to take over like crazy. And I wanted to do stories on that. And, and my, my lead time was, was not realistic about it, and I couldn't do that. Or I, I will sit and think, boy, this is going to be great. And by the time I get it out, Andy Rooney's done it, you know, last week. So um, it, it's going to get better. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Yes. I screwed up somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> I saw that too, and I thought, what, what, was that a bad year for me or what? I don't know. I got no respect at all that year. It was terrible. Who's Glenn Thompson? Glenn Thompson is an executive. You are, oh, every one of you should have a Glenn Thompson in your life. All of you should have a Glenn Thompson. He is an editor who is editor of the uh, Dayton Journal Herald. And he saw my column in a little weekly paper. I got three bucks a week for it, called the Kettering Oakwood Times. And he wrote me a letter and said, I'm going to syndicate you. And I said, OK, how much do you want out of it? He said, I don't want anything. And I said, well, you know, you deserve something. The man has never taken one penny for putting this into syndication, for doing all the work. He said it was just the, the pure pleasure of discovering something and having it, having it fly. And that's what an editor should be about. And I, I thought that was amazing. He's, he's a good friend. He's still alive. And he still reads every book and uh, bask in the glory of it. I'm very grateful to him. Yeah. Yeah, the play is, is based on, on, on the motherhood book. And uh, it, we, they've, they've just found a director. Now, now I don't know if I want to fall on my face on Broadway or if I'd rather fall on my face on television. It's a big decision for me to make. Um, you know, a, a first timer going on Broadway has to be out of her mind, you know. Um, I think we'll rent a tuxedo for one night for my husband and see what happens. But that, that is real risky. It's real chancy. Even if you take it out of town and work your way you know, back east, it's, it's really difficult. The critics are real tough back here. So I'm, I have a dilemma now. I don't know whether or not to turn it into a, a special for television or not, but it's based on motherhood. Yeah? I wondered when that question would come up. It always comes up. Everyone worries about my kids. I don't know. Who cares? They just, uh, I don't know. You know, I'm, I make a living, and, and I really don't hurt anybody. And I, th I think it's really strange. When I started the column, my, my youngest child was in the playpen. He was, he was very slow, actually. He was, <laughs> he was five years old. And... Um, but he, he, he's grown up with it. They all have. And they know something. They, they know when the fictional character takes over and the real one stops. They know this. And I, I never really thought about it that much until I was with one of them one day and someone said, oh, are you the one who? And then they you know, filled in the blank. And I thought, oh, my God, people think this is for real, all of it. Most of it is. 
Um, <laughs> I didn't have to uh, elaborate or embroidery too much on any of it. Uh, that's the truth. All you have to do is just be a really keen observer and uh, be a little nuts to laugh at it. And, and it's, that's the combination. But the, the, kids, the kids are okay with it. And I don't, I don't call them by name. I don't publish their ages. And I never get in close to their personal lives. Not, you know, the dating or anything like that. No, that's hands off. I just don't deal with that at all. Yes, sir. You mentioned that uh, one or two of your columns a couple of different subjects. I'm wondering who might be one or two other columns, humorous or otherwise, or do you forget that respect? Well, there's, there's not a whole lot of us around, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, there, there are some local women. Uh, I, I saw a, a list, you know, we, we started keeping a list at home of, of the imitators that, that we had, and there was a, a spiritual Irma Bombeck and a rural Irma Bombeck and um, a mental puzzle Irma Bombeck, which I thought was redundant, but, um, <laughs> you know, there's a, a lot of that. There is no one at a national level. The men, um, I do respect Buckwald a lot. In fact, I was, uh, we're a very close group because there isn't anyone else who, who does what we do uh, for a living. And I was in New York, and I was signing some books um, in a Doubleday bookstore. And someone brought me a little card and said this had been slipped under the door the night before. And I looked at the card, and it said, Irma, this is my town. You have 24 hours to get out of it, or you will never see Judge Bork alive again. <laughs> Signed, Art Buckwald. <laughs> I'm amazed that no one has asked me about Arizona's governor, um, <laughs> who, who is uh, fighting for his life as we speak. Uh, have you all been following that? It, it's rather incredible because I, I, I brought along uh, some of his wonderful quotes. Um, I keep them with me because I, I, I just can't believe them myself. I get them out once a day and go through them. Uh, one, one of Governor Meekham's quotes is, uh, I'm not a racist. I've got black friends. I employ black people, not because they're black, but because they are the best people who applied for the cotton-picking job. <laughs> And, and th this, this one I loved, CBS Evening News <laughs> asked if the governor would give him the true version of a story. And he answered, don't ever ask me for a true statement again. <laughs> and this one I still haven't figured out. He said, I haven't been getting any positive criticism from anyone. <laughs> I don't know what positive criticism is. Um, I, I still think... Uh, that he's probably the only governor who's going to be making license plates for his own car, but <laughs> other than that, that's it. <laughs> it's an interesting case. It really is. It's, uh, he's waltzed in a new attorney now from the East, which goes over real big in Arizona. <laughs> Anyone else? Is your husband as funny as you are? My husband is a, is a hoot. Yeah, he is. He, he would have to be. I mean, he's got to hang in there. Um, <laughs> I, I tell everyone he keeps me he keeps me real humble and in my place. Whenever I get to feeling pretty good about myself, he will come home from the library and he'll say, um, "Hey, Irma, I was just in the library, and all of your books are in." <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful man. <laughs> That's why I never try. I'm sorry. Mm -mm. No, mm -mm. just issues. I, I have I have a local woman who ran against um, Governor Meekham um, that I stomp for, Carolyn Warner. <clears throat> I have been asked to, to run for president. Did you know that? <laughs> it hasn't gotten on the wire yet. <laughs> it's true. Some some man in Ohio. Um, Got got to sit down figuring all this out and figured I was Democrat and the race was you know so full anyway why not why why not one more so he he said he was going to run me for president and I wrote him back and said I I really was overqualified and uh, <laughs> and would have to take a cut in salary so I didn't <laughs> would not choose to run was there a question over here Did I see someone yeah.
Yeah, American Kansas. The next book is really obviously not a book of humor, but it's certainly not a book on death. It's it's something that is needed by a lot of people. It's a book on children with cancer, and the kids are helping me write it. And it's um, it's a story about life and survival. And I'm getting my information from the kids at camp. And there are a lot of cancer camps all over the country, and I go up and visit with the kids and talk with them, and they are so honest and have such spirit. Uh, they are amazing. They're not uncomfortable with it, and I'm not uncomfortable with them. The first three months, I cried a lot. That's all I did. I, I read the le letters, and I cried. I read letters, and I cried. And I thought, this is nonsense. You know, How can you do a book on, on kids like this if you're going to fall apart? And the more I visited with them, the more positive I got about it. And I'm okay now, and, and I think they, they deserve, they deserve all of it. And they're going to get the best book I know how to write. And I'm taking the pages to New York of the first three chapters now, so it's on its way. Yes? About what campaign? I don't know too much about her campaign. I, I came. I come from another direction, um, and, and and I will preface it with this: just because there were different factions of the feminist movement, uh, I hated the criticism that we all couldn't agree. You know, men never agree on where to have lunch. So what what are we talking about here? That that to me was not a weakness as far as I was concerned. Um, I was never a member of Now because of my stand on abortion. I'm opposed to it. I'm a Catholic. Um, and that was difficult for me. So I came from another direction. I came from ERA America, and I worked under their banner. Um, when I saw Ellie in Atlanta, I hadn't seen her in a long time, and she did tell me about their plans to um, uh, reword the 27th Amendment. And I think this is wonderful. I, th I think we're going to have to get started all over again. However, I still feel that, in my mind, that, that this will have to come from another direction. It will have to come from one of those conservatives out there who couldn't possibly vote for it before. It has to be their idea this time. I don't think it can go that same, same route again that it went before. I think there's too much opposition. I don't think the Eagle Forum was that formidable. I don't think Phyllis Schlafly was that formidable. I think she just sort of touched upon uh, a group of women who probably looked at, at some women who looked very strident to them, some women who were uh, very powerful to them, and they said, they're not like us. Yes, they are. We are all alike. We are all mothers. Uh, you add up our kids. You add up our time in the utility room. You add up our marriage years. Yeah. We're, we're, we're just like they are, but they don't see that. And I think it does have to come from a conservative camp and, and be brought in again. And we don't have any momentum now. We don't. We've lost it. We have lost the momentum, and we have to get that going again. Because people, I don't see any candidate except Jesse Jackson who is saying, you know, women's rights. No one else is mentioning it. It is not politically prudent to do so. So they're, they're not using us. They don't need us. <sighs> and I'm not sure that we're a, a full-blown coalition at this point. Wish we were. Yeah. Yes? I'll be the first one to use this. <laughs> oh, this is going to be big, isn't it? <laughs> it's right there. You poke a lot of fun in your, in your humor at things that happened during your marriage. Um, whether I'm making a mistake or not, I'm getting married. And every, every, oh, I'm so glad. No, but every, <laughs> most of my friends tell me that I'm too young. How old are you? I'm 24. All right, well, and, and a lot of my relatives tell me I'm too young. In fact, in mm -hmm. today's, today's world, it says, today's society says, wait, keep your options open, go out and, 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 and don't get tied down too soon. Mm -hmm. And then I remember reading an article um, in Newsweek by Robert McFarlane's wife. It was within the last year. I don't remember when mm -hmm. it was published. And she wrote that people today are getting married too late because they don't have time 
to, uh, to share the, the things that they accomplish along the way. They're not sharing it with anybody. So I was going to ask you whether you think people are getting married too young or, or, or too uh, old today. And then I said to myself, no, I know what she's going to say. She's going to say... What's she going to say? <laughs> make a note. <laughs> well, th I thought you were going to say um, that people, you, you might say that people are waiting too long, that there's a lot of good that can comes out of, of marriage. And then I started thinking about your type of humor. And in your humor, it's, it seemed to reinforce uh, a lot of traditional values. Um, well, your tradition, humor, traditional isn't any particular age. Well, I, I don't. Well, <laughs> I have to confess, I, I don't. I don't know that much about you. I, I, I've never heard you described as a feminist before, and I haven't read all of your works. I've read. I've read your your article, your, mm -hmm. your um, newspaper stuff, and when I read it, it's funny. And when I read the funny little things that happen in in, in uh, to a housewife or or whatever, it's sort of it. it it's more disarming feminism than feminism. And I guess this is a long, convoluted way of saying... <laughs> I'm getting older, <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> Do you think that your humor really helps the feminist movement? Because I don't see this... When I read it, when oh, I read yeah. your humor... It's sort we of, needed it. We huh? needed it yeah, desperately. Well, well, that, that's, oh, that's yes. We needed it desperately. I, I wouldn't follow anyone to the women's room who, who didn't have a sense of humor. And I think at first the women's movement was so serious about it because they wanted to be taken seriously. And they thought if we, if we smile and laugh, they'll say, well, you know, those women over there, you know, arguing over the check for the watercress salad, you know how they are. And they wouldn't take us seriously, and I'm, I'm sure that's why they did it. But to me, um, having a sense of humor comes out with, um, with being pretty sure of yourself. A lot of self-confidence, whether it's marriage or kids or feminist movement or what it is. That comes from confidence. And I have enough confidence in the movement, in my marriage, and in all of that. And as for getting married, you know, I mean, you, you can't put that in, in an age group and say, yes, everyone should be married by 22 or 28 or wait until you're 30. You can't say that. I mean, you don't, you don't, you can't, you don't have that kind of control over your life. And if you want guarantees, you have to go live with a car battery because, <laughs> I mean, that's the only way you're going to get it. And, and it is scary. It is scary. You, you know, you don't want to miss anything. Well, I really didn't want to talk about... Oh, you didn't want to talk about your marriage. No, no. <laughs> but when I hear you talking about sorting socks, mm -hmm. I think I, maybe it's my conception of what a feminist is, but someone who, who pokes fun at it... I, well, I laugh at it, and everyone else laughs at it, and, and then I don't think it's it's that serious because it's funny. Oh, really, don't? Well, no, because it's funny. But if you said, "God, this sucks," the, sorting these socks. Well, I, well, I, then, I, I, I know. Okay. Th then, then I might take it more seriously. Is, yeah. Does that well, let, let me tell you my reaction to it. In, in 1960. Um, 65, 64, something like that, Betty Friedan came to town. And I was living in the suburbs that I described earlier. And Betty Friedan came and, and she, I, 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 got, oh, I got a babysitter for the kids and we drove downtown and we parked the car and we run in to this memorial hall in Dayton and I hear Betty Friedan for the first time. And she's talking, you know, about my life. And it is funny to me. It is funny because someone knew what I knew, and I thought I was the only one who knew it. But the difference was she didn't laugh. And I couldn't have survived it if I didn't laugh. And I thought, here is a woman telling me what to do. She said, get out of that kitchen, lady. You know, get out and do, do your number. I can't. I have to live within my own limitations. I can't do that. So she was, she was, she was putting, giving me an option that I didn't have, and I think this is what happened. They said, "Hey, you know, you're dummies for doing this. I don't want to be told that." So our our approach when when I went on the road was to say, "Hey, look, you keep the good stuff you've got, you hang on to it with everything you've got, but you still have options open to you, and you still have a right to be equal under the laws of this land." That's important, and that, that's what our message was. It wasn't to be better than or to be way out here or to put anyone else down. It was simply dealing with when the laws of this land are written, they would include women. It was just that simple.
which wasn't simple at all. And, and, and the women loved it. We made a lot of converts along the way, a lot of born-agains. <laughs> it worked. It really did. But we're serious about it. Well, okay. I didn't say that with a smile on my face at all. I'm serious. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes. Um, did you ever feel uh, any criticism from some of your more militant uh, sisters and feminist movements? It didn't get back to me. Um, some of them never really knew what I was all about. I, w I was always hearing from, from Gloria, who would, would want me to come someplace, you know, for some... Uh, um, you know, a, a abortion rally or something, and I kept saying, "No, I can't. I can't do that." And even on the President's Commission, when we when we voted, there were always two of us who voted against. You know, because of our of our views, and that's okay. That's all right. We we can dare to be different about that. And the Equal Rights Amendment had nothing to do with the abortion issue, absolutely nothing. So I was very comfortable with that. No, I, I didn't get any criticism. They, uh, toward the end, I mean, they, they, they could use all the help they were getting. <sighs> I say toward the end. You know what I mean, when it went, when it went down <laughs> in defeat. Anyone else? Okay. One more. All right, one more. No, I've always done that. I've been real stupid about it. Uh, <laughs> someone um, came out from, um, God, what, I'm trying to think which magazine it was, um, Family Circle, and they wanted to do a story on, uh, on my struggles. And I said, I didn't, I didn't have any struggles. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you're, you're not looking at tragedy here. And they said, well, you know, your father died at nine. And I said, you know, a lot of fathers die, you know, when kids are young. It's not too unusual. And they, they tried to, to, you know, have me as someone who's overcome all this adversity. I didn't have any adversity. You know, most people work their way through schools and stuff. That's no big deal. And, and we always came from a family that um, um, we just had a real good time. And we still are. My mother is a, a real piece of work. I mean, she is incredible. Um, she's amazing. She went with me to... Um, the Johnny Carson show, this was back in the 60s, first, my, my baptism under fire, the first national television show I'd ever done in my entire life, and, I, and that's the one. And my mother said, well, if you're going out there, Irma, and try to be something you're not, then you're going to bomb. But if you go out and just be yourself, you're going to be wonderful. And I said, Mother, you are so right. So I went out, and I was myself, and I bombed so bad. <laughs> so much from others, but um, she's a character. She's a real character. She, um, if she's on a television show with me, she will take over the entire show. She will, <laughs> that's the way she is. <laughs> Good family, though. Neat family. Okay, is that it? I thank you all very much for coming. Thank you.